Do you ever feel unnecessary? Well, Nancy DeMoss Walgamu says your life has significance. God has put you here for a purpose. Not just to take up space, to while your life away. God has a job with your name on it. A purpose, an intent. Welcome to Revive Our Hearts Weekend. I'm Dana Gresh, and let me repeat what Nancy just said. Your life has purpose. Let's light a passion under it today. Okay, I'm going to start today's program a little differently than normal. 7 a.m. the usual morning lineup. Start on the chores and sweep to the floors all clean. Polish and wax, do laundry and mop and shine up. Sweep again and by then it's like 7.15. Maybe you recognize that song from the movie Tangled. And maybe it sounds like your life except that your chores take a whole lot longer. <laughs> Maybe this sounds like you too. And I'll keep wandering, 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 wandering. Where will my life begin? That's one perspective on life. Let's look at another perspective from a source that's a lot more reliable than Disney. Here's 1 Peter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen race a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's your purpose. And you can do that no matter your situation. You can do that from a desk job. You can do it from home with toddlers under your feet. You can do it writing contracts or doing chores. And if that's not convincing enough, listen to this from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. Wow. You know, sometimes I feel foolish. I definitely feel weak now and then. I've even been despised before. Can you identify with these qualities? Take heart. In Christ, you are wise. In Christ, you are strong. And Jesus loves you. In fact, he has a plan to use you in amazing ways. And we're going to talk about that today. Sabina Wormbrand was one woman who was despised. Her story is proof that you can be used by God from anywhere. She and her pastor husband, Richard, were arrested by Nazis during World War II, and that was the beginning of long years of imprisonment and torture. In the eyes of her captors, she was nothing. But she wasn't nothing to God. He used her suffering to strengthen her love for him. Here's John Gruders to give us some background information. So the very first time they get picked up by the Nazis, it's the first time either of them have been arrested, certainly the first time either of them had been beaten, and they don't start out as experts in this field. They don't start out like, yes, we just suffer for Jesus. And They have, like the rest of us, fear. And, and the very first thing they meet in the prison, she says, she says to him, looking at the scar on his face, was it, was it horrible? And he says to her, there was pain. I will not lie to you. But later in that same scene, he says, I am grateful to be among the beaten by his grace rather than among those who beat. And this is the beginning of that understanding, a deeper understanding that they begin to live out of what it means to be Christ followers, of understanding Jesus' call, which is so radical, you know, to turn the other cheek if an enemy strikes you on on one cheek, to if someone says, carry my pack a mile, that you carry it two miles. Like this kind of radical thing that we hear about in Sunday school, that we read about in the Bible, it becomes the word made flesh once you are put in that situation. And no one wants to be put in that situation that I know. But if you end up in that situation in life, and at that point you start to live out the words of Christ, then we actually are now becoming transformed into his image, which really is the goal of all Christians. Well, as World War II drew toward an end, Romania was released from Nazi control only to be taken over by communists influenced by the Soviet Union. 
1948, Richard was arrested for sharing the gospel and for denouncing communism. Sabina was arrested in 1950 and spent three years in a forced labor camp. Here's Sabina reminding herself and us of truths we can stand on in the middle of trials. In the prison camp, she filled her mind with truth like this. I have a very famous God, the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is my heavenly father, a very famous God. Then I have a Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior of Israel, is my Savior, my teacher, my Lord, and my friend. And then I have also a very famous book, the Bible, in prison cells where we didn't have any book, neither the Bible or any bit of paper, a word which we kept in our heart, a word from this famous book from the Bible could give new life and new hope to those in despair. In the prison work camp, Sabina faced beatings and hard labor. She was hungry and even would eat grass to survive. In the middle of all that suffering, she went through periods of doubt when it felt like she was far from God. But she also experienced his presence in a whole new way. The prison is a very hard place, and the days in prison could not be counted in years as it is usually. I say my husband has made 14 years of communist prison. Every day has 24 hours, and every hour has 60 minutes, and you make prison minute by minute and day by day. It is a very hard time, and the human heart is so frail and we very quickly lose our vision of God. We very quickly see the dark prison cell, the longing, the hunger, the mockery of the communists. But God knows how we are, and he knows every one of those who are his. In dark prison cells where no man could help, where human help could not reach the Christians, Jesus himself would make know us that he is the Lord. And sometimes when it was very, very heavy, hungry, beaten, mocked, and forsaken by all men, Jesus himself would lift the veil for a fraction of a second and show us his beauty. Let us hear the beauties of paradise. And so we got new strengths. Does that sound like a woman who was nothing? I don't think so. That's Sabina Wormbrand explaining how God comforted her during years of imprisonment and torture. Later, she used the truths that she had learned and experienced to minister to others, and God had turned a seemingly insignificant woman into a mighty instrument for His kingdom. You know, that reminds me of another woman from U.S. history who was used by God in an unusual way, and we're going to hear about her from Dr. Karen Ellis. Karen is a professor at Reformed Theological Seminary, and she's the director of the Edmiston Center for the Study of the Bible and Ethnicity in Atlanta, Georgia. Now, first, imagine that you're standing on a busy dock at sunset, watching boats coming and going, just like you might in any port city, except it's the 1700s. And there you see perhaps the most heart-rending scene possible. A slave ship has just arrived. It's packed with human beings made in God's image, but who are being treated worse than animals. The sights, sounds, and smells are indescribable. From this pestilence, 
a voice rises. A woman named Phyllis Wheatley, born in 1754, is seven years old when she makes this trip, called the Middle Passage. And she will later write about her experience as a Christian and as American and as an abolitionist. She helped others around her reconcile the inconsistencies of people who were saying that Christianity favored the people who looked like them. And the model of Christ in Providence gave her incredible comfort. And her pen and gifting gave her incredible courage and strength to promote a revolution that was both temporal and eternal. Let me give you a sampling of Phyllis Wheatley's work. She wrote about her Middle Passage experience on the ship coming to America, to the Earl of Dartmouth. You've heard of Dartmouth University, Dartmouth College? This is him, before the, before the school exists. She writes him these words. She says, I... Young in life, by seeming cruel fate, was snatched from Africa's fancied happy seat. What pangs excruciating must molest, what sorrows labor in my parents' breast. Steeled was that soul, and by no misery moved, that from a father seized his babe beloved. Such, such my case. And can I then but pray that others may never feel tyrannic sway? Now, Wheatley's brilliance showed at a very early age. After she was kidnapped from Senegambia and made the trip from West Africa to America at the age of seven, she was purchased at auction by the Wheatley household, and she was given the name of the slaving vessel that brought her over. So the name of the ship was the Phyllis. She came and was taught the English alphabet by the Wheatley's daughter. She was trained to be a domestic. In Senegal and Gambia, you could find certain types of slaves. You know how uh, very much like uh, the, the dehumanization process was to say, oh, well, if you go, uh, kind of like how we do with dogs today. You know, this is a good dog for police work if you get this German shepherd. Well, they had this, they had the entire region mapped out for different kinds of slaves coming from different regions. So she came from Senegal and Gambia, which was appropriate for various types of kinds of work. But the Christian Wheatley soon realized that she needed to be in a life of service with a pen in her hand and not a broom. We don't know exactly how she got her education, but there's only solid evidence that she was educated well. 1773, her first literary work is published in the form of a small book to mixed acclaim and sent to the new colonies in England. If you've ever heard of the book The Valley of Vision, you also need to own Phyllis Wheatley's first and only book of poems, poems on various subjects, religious and moral. And her owners helped her finance its publication. Now, remember, Africans are considered inferior in intelligence at this point. So, they see a woman who has written extensive poetry, she's translating, and the men of the day say, this is impossible. So as proof of her authorship, the volume included a preface where 17 Boston men actually claimed that, yes, she had indeed written her poems. Wheatley's work reflects the themes of redemption, the image of God, original sin, total depravity, suffering for righteousness. And she would have known through the abolitionist social circles of Boston that Christians in America preached that the Bible justified slavery. But with access to her English Bibles and the original languages, she would have seen that this was inconsistent with the story. I will be your God. You will be my people and I will gather you from all the nations. She would have seen that slavery was inconsistent with Old Testament Israel in both the ancient languages and in English. And she would have thought, while she was sitting in the rafters of the slave section of the old congregational church in South Boston, she would have heard Reverend Sewell talking about freedom from tyranny in England. And she would have thought of freedom from tyranny for herself. By all accounts, as an African and a woman, 
and a slave. Wheatley should have remained voiceless in the post-colonial world that surround her, yet she managed to be instrumental in both the temporal revolution and the eternal one. This is radical. She takes what they have to offer her theologically, and then she uses it biblically to hold up the gospel mirror to their faces. This is exercising influence when you don't have authority. This is how the underground runs. And there are stories like this all over American history. The forgotten, the voiceless, the overlooked, but they're there for the taking. So I've mined these diamonds for you to give and to encourage you to find the people in history, to learn from the people in history, to learn from the people in the global underground who are following the story of God's people as closely as they can. Nobody's going to do it perfectly. Perfect doesn't come till we get to glory. But there are some who got closer to it than others. Find them. Tell each other about them. Share their stories. And then get in the stream yourself. Wow. Are you motivated to go find those behind-the-scenes forgotten people? Oh, I am. The people who are really doing amazing things for God. Oh, let's go find them. That was Dr. Karen Ellis telling us about Phyllis Wheatley. Sabina Wormbrand and Phyllis Wheatley both had seasons of intense suffering. They could easily have wondered if they could ever do anything useful. But in God's grace, they did. Still, their stories are kind of extreme, right? You probably haven't been in similar situations. Maybe you're thinking, do the same principles apply in my life, my ordinary life? Well, let me assure you, they do. Nancy demoss Walgenmuth talked about that. She says that it doesn't matter who you are. You might have endured lots of suffering. You might have a boring life. Or maybe you are in a position of influence. God wants to use you. Let's listen. So as you think about your life and the providence of God, think about what God has given you, the privileges, the blessings, salvation. When a billion people or more on this planet have never heard the name of Jesus, it's in God's providence that you came to hear the gospel, that you were brought to faith in Christ, that you have a knowledge of God's word. The abilities you have, the influence you have, the material resources you have, those are all gifts and the stewardship from God in His providence. Do you think God intended you to squander those things or use them on yourself? Just to enjoy them for your own pleasure? Not on your life. God entrusted those experiences, those opportunities, those blessings to you as a steward so that you will serve Him and use them to further His kingdom here on earth. All those blessings we enjoy, they're not for our happiness, not for our satisfaction, not for our pleasure. They're for God's glory, for such a time as this. The home you were born into, the opportunities that you've had, the culture that you live in, the era that you live in, it's all according to the providence of God and for the purposes of God and His kingdom. You are not in the position you are in by accident. And I look around this room and there are many different life positions. Some of you have a lot of little kids. Some of you are single. Some of you are younger students. Some of you are empty nesters. Some of you are in your senior years and everything in between, all different seasons of life. But you are not in that season or that position by accident. God has a purpose in mind for you. Who knows whether you have come to the kingdom the kingdom where God has placed you, the set of circumstances where God has placed you, even if you are where you are as a result of having messed up in life, in God's providence, as you are repentant and broken, God has a place and a purpose for you here and now in his kingdom. It's an amazing thing how God's providence can overrule the losses and the failures caused by our sins. 
Now, I don't mean by that to minimize sin in any sense. But I'm just saying, where would we be if God didn't redeem hopeless, helpless messes? That's what we are, apart from Christ. God has put you here for a purpose, not just to take up space, to while your life away. God has a job with your name on it, a purpose, an intent. You may think, I'm not a queen. I'm not in the palace. I don't have any position of great influence. It's all I can do to survive homeschooling these kids. I'm just trying to keep my head above water. I'm telling you, that's your kingdom. And God has put you there in that home for such a time as this with an incredible opportunity that no one else has been given to nurture those children to be followers of Jesus Christ. That's a big job for such a time as this. Say, I'm just a clerk in a store. I don't have a husband. I don't have kids. God put you in that store. That's your kingdom for such a time as this, to represent him, to represent his kingdom. You say, I'm retired. I'm widowed. My kids are scattered across the country. There's no purpose. There's no use for my life. God puts you in that place, that little apartment, that retirement home, that's your kingdom for such a time as this. What can you do? You can pray. You can intercede. You can encourage pastors. You can encourage young moms, other widows with notes, with prayers. God's got a purpose for you, and it's not just to while your life away. You say, I'm just a student. That classroom may be your kingdom. God's got a purpose for you. God's got a plan for you. And it's not just to get a degree. It's not just to get a job. It's to fulfill God's purpose for such a time as this. God put you there now for a purpose. Who knows but that you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Who knows how God may want to use your life where you are? One of the things I so appreciate about my upbringing is that my dad had a vision for his seven children, for us kids to fulfill the purpose that God had for our lives, whatever that might be. My dad didn't know what it was, but he wanted us to fulfill that. And he gave us a vision that we could be used by God, that God had a purpose for our lives. It was individual. It was special. It was for us and that we were to fulfill that purpose. And he gave me a vision long before I ever heard of Revive Our Hearts, long before I was doing conferences, long before we started a radio program. God entrusted through my parents to me a vision that my life had been brought to God's kingdom for such a time as this. And I have believed for years and years since I was a little girl that God put me here in this world in this country, in this place, and now in this ministry of Revive Our Hearts for such a time as this. Is it hard? Yes, sometimes it's very hard. Is it lonely? Yes, sometimes it's very lonely. Sometimes you think, am I the only person on the planet who is concerned about these issues, who carries these things on my heart? But that's not what it's about. It's not about me. It's not about you. Do I feel overwhelmed sometimes with the tide of evil and what it's going to take to overcome that? Yes, I do. But it's not about how I feel. It's not about what I want. It's about the fact that God has a mission for my life. He has a mission for your life. There are some days, yes, that I wish to have, you know, why can't I have a more average life like so many other Christians without all the demands of service? Wouldn't that be great? Yeah, for about three minutes, but not if it caused me to step outside of God's mission and God's purpose for my life. I don't have a choice when it comes down to it, and neither do you. I don't care how old you are, what season of life you are. You say, I'm not this big, great speaker. I don't have a radio program. You don't need a radio program. God's given you children and grandchildren that I can't reach, but you can because God put you here for such a time as this. I've been put here in this place. You've been put in your place. I've been put here at this time. You've been put here at this time for such a time as this to bring God glory. So don't say, don't think, I don't have anything to offer. My life doesn't really count. Charles Spurgeon said it this way, though you be no better than a mere cipher, that's a zero, yet the Lord can make something of you. Set one before a zero, and it is a 10 immediately. 
Let two or three zeros combine to serve the Lord, and if the Lord heads them, these nothings become tens of thousands. Who knows what you can do? God chooses and uses nobodies. He infuses them with His grace and His power, and He uses them in mighty ways. And so, a little shepherd boy becomes the psalmist king of Israel, and through him comes the Messiah. A Moabite widow becomes an ancestress of the Savior. A redeemed harlot becomes instrumental in the children of Israel conquering the city of Jericho. An orphan girl in a foreign land becomes a queen who saves the lives of millions of Jews. And a teenage virgin gives birth to the Savior of the world. Who would have thought it? Who could have planned it? Who but God? And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. That's Nancy DeMoss Walgamuth. And you know, what she just said made me think, you can't know exactly what God is going to do through you, but you can know this. You are here right now, not somewhere else at some other time by God's design. Even if your current circumstances are a result of your own sin, He can redeem those for His purposes. Will you ask Him to do that? In a minute, we're going to hear about more seemingly insignificant women. But first, if you enjoyed today's program, you might be interested in a new resource from the Revive Our Hearts team. You can find the stories of Sabina Wormbrand and Phyllis Wheatley and others in the book Unremarkable. The subtitle is 10 Ordinary Women Who Impacted the World for Christ. And we've just written Unremarkable Volume 2. In that one, you'll read about Amy Carmichael, Helen Rosevere, Florence Nightingale, and others. You'll receive both of these booklets when you contact us with your donation of any amount to Revive Our Hearts. When you do that, you're being used by God to help spread the message of freedom, fullness, and fruitfulness in Christ, even if you feel very unremarkable. We'll say thank you by sending you a physical copy of Unremarkable Volume 1 and instructions for how to download an advanced digital copy of Unremarkable Volume 2. To give, go to reviveourhearts.com or call us at 1-800-569-5959. Don't forget to ask for both books when you do. That's 1-800-569-5959. Now, the women we heard about today are well enough known that we can be familiar with their stories, and aren't we glad that we can learn from them? But we all know women who are never going to be the subject of a biography, are never going to host a podcast or have lots of social media followers, but who are faithful in following God's call to represent Him to other people. We wanted you to hear about a few of those. So we've asked several ladies to tell us about women who influenced their lives. Here's what Christy, Stacy, Stacy, and Tatiana had to say. My grandma, she would encourage me to learn domestic skills by, you know, she'd bring me yarn and knitting needles and teach me how to make bread and pie. A very good friend of mine named Roz, and I watched her care for her aging father. My mom. The difference um, when it was just a religion for her and when the word really soaked in. My mom came from a rough background that most people would carry for the rest of their life. And do you think she was the way she was because she loved the Lord? And it's a hard struggle at times, but she does it with grace. It was really God's heart in my mom that made her stand out that the rest of the world would probably never know about. But my mom really held on to the fact of Christ as her Redeemer. And she let that be the thing that drove her. Thanks for listening today. I hope you'll join me next week to hear about how you can pursue Christ more than anything else. I'm Dana Gresh. We'll see you next time for Revive Our Hearts Weekend. Revive Our Hearts Weekend, calling you to freedom, fullness, and fruitfulness in Christ.